the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Back on the show today, Melissa Tofton, Empowerment, Sexual Leadership, kink bdsm general gorgeousness delight of my life welcome welcome back Mm -hmm. thank you for having me again (laughs) so So, thank you it's good to have you here your last episode has been one of the most popular ones it's in the top 10 and this has sort of come back onto my radar lately and uh yeah i said let's chat again so how are you how are you doing first of all Mm-hmm. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, and it was kind of, it was interesting to notice that it was one of the most popular ones because I, I feel like you and I both felt a bit nervous about how people might respond to the conversation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it's, I think it was the first one we did on anything kind of sexual as a topic, you know, and then me and you are friends, we go back a little bit and it's kind of like the vibe, you know, has a certain vibe there. So I was definitely not quite sure how that would land, but it seems like people enjoyed it. And, you know, interesting, I'd say that was about maybe two years ago almost. And in that time, I think sort of things kinky have got more mainstream, wouldn't you say? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I feel like everybody, like everybody and their auntie is like a tantra dakini. And like, you know, everybody all of a sudden, like, you know, even my mom, um, even my mom, like, has a harness that she bought from H&M, you know? It's Your like, mom has a harness. You know, my mom's like H&M. giving me like BDSM advice. It's like the world has changed. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really shifted. <laughs> That has really shifted. I mean, I, it was 40 Shades of Grey sort of started this, you know, this awful book that started the kind of trending. But I've definitely seen like, you know, the young people as well are kind of cool. They're kind of groovy with this. And, you know, consent culture is much bigger, which has, you know, been a big thing, hasn't it? And uh, people would just say now, like fairly regular kind of thing. Oh, well, I'm a switch, you know, or whatever. And there's right. YouTube channels with people on and it's, it's become, a, it's out of the closet a little bit. Right. Yeah. And also with that, I feel like everybody wants to be in the sex kind of in the sex positive industry as well, because they're noticing that it's it's not so taboo anymore. It's like you can, you know, you can be a sex educator and have your mom and your grandmother or whatever in your family see your posts. And it's not you know, you're not going to be like you're not going to be not allowed to come over for dinner for Christmas anymore. You know, it's not not the same way that it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, yeah. It's, it's, I don't know, different people listen in different countries. Some of our Russian friends might be disagreeing, for example, but it's, you know, it seems to in the Western world have caught on a lot. Okay, let's take a step back then. So for those who didn't catch your first episode, tell us a little bit about your history, like how you got interested in the body and in this subject particularly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to share. So um, I come from a lineage of art and aesthetics and the way that I fell in love with um, with BDSM specifically rather than the body. Let's say BDSM was my entry point into the body. Um, that I used to be a fashion designer, like a fetish fashion designer. And I also used to ride horses and I had this fascination of, um, of kind of equestrian inspired fetish clothing. So I got into making handmade leather goods. And then in my journey of making handmade leather goods for kinky people, I noticed that there was this fascination with, um, with the body, but it was, however, it was through this kind of, I think you, you used the words pretty well. You said the pursuit of the vivid. Okay. No, I'm podcast. glad I said that. So that's good. That yeah. Was <laughs> Some nice words. words. Yeah. I was like, I wrote that down. It was really good. <laughs> yeah. And so my journey into the body is, has been through from going from intensity, going from um, hardcore, like you could say like the extreme sports of the sex world and also mm-hmm. of the yoga mm-hmm. world, like ashtanga yoga so i met you in a yoga studio originally didn't i the the legend is that i was in this yoga studio full of very middle class boring looking people and then you walked in and sort of dressed in black leather and threw down this black mat in front of me and i was like we're gonna be friends (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I was behind you actually, but yeah. behind, but you remember the position. <laughs> Uh, let's let's not read too much into that. Uh, uh, who remembers the positioning of who where? You were behind me, were we? Okay, well, I'm yes. glad you had a nice view for the session. <laughs> yeah, and so I used to be all about, like, I can do everything, you know. Yeah. I can stand in the fire. I can take it all. Yeah. And then I had a... And then just after our podcast, actually, I had some beautiful humbling experiences in the body of, mm. um, of, of re-traumatization and of really becoming aware of just how sensitive I really am. Mm. Um, and through that, having to, I already started my journey into embodiment anyway. However, rather than it being a hobby, it became a necessity. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So it was, so you got into the sort of kink first and then the embodiment later, but then realizing that that was very central or very core to what, what you were most interested in. Cause I, I think I've seen your journey over the last few years of kind of more and more trauma based stuff, embodiment based stuff, uh, kind of wider picture. Um, yeah, so totally. I'm hearing that right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and I needed to have that embodied, you know, a lot of people right now, there's like so much, it's almost like the new workshop trend is to be a trauma-informed facilitator. Everyone's trauma-informed. Right? Like, Which is super, super, yeah. Like, fuck yes. Fuck yes to that. that. It wasn't the case. Like when I met you in the yoga world, it was just starting as a conversation. It was yoga was just realizing that trauma was a thing and maybe we shouldn't be, you know, creeping up behind people in a yoga studio. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, like people... I'm more informed at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's take a step back. What are we talking about here? Maybe people have heard King or BDSM. Maybe they think it's like some creepy German guy dressed in leather or whatever. Like maybe they think it's like something sexy and cool. I don't know. So maybe we should just take a step back and maybe like mm. say, what do you mean when you're talking about these things? Yeah. So what I mean when I'm talking about um, kink, well, what, what I focus on is, is power and how power shows up in the most subtle and obvious layers in an erotic interaction. Um, and so in kink, it's just more obvious. It's like there is a very, it's, you know, they even have names, you know, there's a dominant and a, and a submissive, like, the, you know, it's explicit, right? Like nobody said yeah. when a, a short man and a tall man meet in the street and there's a dominance hierarchy and there's some sort of power relationship, it's not necessarily named explicitly, right? It's just a, a right. talking down to from the tall man to the short man or, you know, right. whatever the gender or racial kind of dial, you know, narratives might be there. That, that could be implicit and maybe not a good one that we're just unconsciously inheriting, right? Right. Like, and do I want to talk down to every man who's shorter than me just because he's shorter? That seems a bit prejudicial, right? Mm. But like, yeah. So is that the kind of thing you're talking about here, that it's making explicit some of these implicit things? For sure. It's bringing these... Um, I have a problem with the word shadow and dark in general, so I don't uh, want to associate them with this, but let me be honest. I use the word honest. It brings honest okay. parts of ourselves to the light. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. Yeah. Because it's like in civilization, we're all pretending we're nice people, but part of us kind of wants to choke someone or whip someone or be tied up or be choked or, you know, part of us is, is that's there for, I would say all of us to different mm -hmm. degrees, mm -hmm. right? Like, are you in touch with that part of you that wants to be victimized or and oppressive that part of you that wants to be violent that part of you that we're, like and, and what is lost when we're not in touch with that part because someone says like that's good we're civilized people it's good not mm. to be in touch with your urge to beat someone surely that's a good thing how would you respond mm. to that what is lost is that it's the um it's the compromise of our full expression of ourselves mm -hmm. it's like we're not um, we're not really getting access to the full spectrum of our, of, of our possibility of, of how we can really fully show up in the world. Um, and in order to fully, in order, in, order, in order to be able to like fully show up and with certainty and be like, this is my diamond to the world. This is my purpose. I need to also have a look at and confront those parts of myself that I maybe don't want to like show to my whole like Facebook feed or whatever, you know, it's like, right, it's like, right. Because right? In, the, in, the, in a time, are you okay if I jump in like this occasionally, Melissa? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love the way we... Yeah, yeah no, I kind of assume it. <laughs> I just get to get permission. So there's a way in which in this public space of social media and public domain, there's maybe some things that are a little bit vulnerable to be explored or we might get judged for. You know, I noticed myself earlier when I said, hey, we all want to choke people out. Right? Like, I can imagine people going, you know, writing, you know, emails, like, oh, Mark says he's a violent guy. He wants to choke people. Oh, my God. You know, and it's like, it's like, okay, that's a pretty difficult thing to say in public. And there's more, there's definitely, think other places I would not go in public 
I would happily admit to you privately. And we need those spaces where we can explore those parts of ourselves. Even if only to say, you know what, I absolutely never want to hurt a fly in my life. Mm. And, and personally, my experience of people who are into kink is that they're more kind and less dangerous if it's mm. conscious kink. That I, I feel safer around those people because they're owning a side of themselves that they won't then accidentally slip into. For that sure. Sense? Yeah, that is like you're hitting the nail on the head. That is exactly what I'm excited about, about creating these spaces where people are being, people are alchemizing these honest parts of themselves. It's not about, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, there's this part of you that wants to take, then we should find spaces where you can just take as much as possible. Right. It's about it's about no, there is in every one of us, there is the desire to create. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, that gets promoted. We get, we get allowed to create most of the time. I feel like especially men, like male socialized people get given permission to create and express a lot. We don't, none of us, even, even, and especially men, especially in the post me too era that we live in, nobody gets permission to take. Right. Right. Like, like, yeah. Okay. And that there are honest parts of us. And so it's like, we want to find, we want to have safe containers where we can have ethical, ethical and harmless expressions of those truths, of those creative and destructive truths. And the thing about BDSM is that it, encaps, it gives us an opportunity to do both of those things at the same time. Yeah. Because we're, you know, it's like we're creating this scene, you know, even like BDSM, BDSM uh, experiences are even called scenes. So they yeah, should explain what that is for people. Like, what is a scene? So a scene is, is um, almost like, like a ritual, an experience. Any kind of BDSM experience is usually called a scene because it has a strict structure. There is a beginning, right. a middle, and an end. There is before um, scene negotiation where you would talk with somebody about what's going to happen. It's like I have spoken to so many different people in different kind of similar body-based ritual containers like wrestlers, porn stars, and they all have the same scene way of okay. seeing these experiences. Okay, because it gives a frame that creates safety, doesn't it? That, right. And in BDSM, we mean very literally as well as emotionally, that it's like, okay, you're going to slap me this way, but not this way. You can touch my face, but you can't leave marks. If I say stop, this is the safety word. This is, mm -hmm. you know, this is how it's going to end. It lasts for this long. And this is the aftercare that I need. So, you know, we, we feel good afterwards with each other. And there's a beginning and a middle and end there. And there's a structure mm -hmm. to it. And that has made the potential for a lot of consciousness around things. Because the average couple just having normal Friday night sex probably wouldn't do that. There wouldn't mm -hmm. be the same level of discussion because it doesn't have to be, right? Like, if I'm going to put a plastic bag over someone's head, there better be some fucking discussion as to what's going on. Just just practically, right? Yeah, it's And then necessary. emotionally, we're playing with fire too, right? Like, there's mm -hmm. potential for people to be re-traumatized, to be upset, you know, to feel degraded. You know, there's all sorts of potential stuff there emotionally. For sure. And that, I would say I want to almost like rewind to the beginning of the chat where you were saying like, it's normalized now. Like my mom's wearing a harness and probably has like a whole cupboard of floggers and like my stepsister who's like seven years younger than me probably has a collar. Like, you know, all of this, like everyone's stepping into it, which, you know, there's the liberation. There's like the pro liberation, pro sex, positive person part of me. That's like, yay. And then there's the other part of me. That's like the newly found part of me. That's the more sensitized part of me. That's like, oh, I really hope that people are aware of, of how sensitive we are and that these are super edgy um, games. Yeah. Right, right. So maybe, I mean, is there an element here of like, okay, devil's advocate, or to make it even more evil, lawyer's advocate. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry, my lawyer's quite nice. If you're out there, I, I love you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I love you to work. But, um, okay, so two things. One, some people would say this is a sort of corruption of normal healthy sexuality. They'd say, look, healthy sexuality is about pleasure and making love and connection and bringing power into it is a corruption. And they'd say that's a side thing. That's not, you know, a neutral would be a sideline and best would be, at worst would be like, that's actively, actively getting away. You know, like how can you love someone if you're slapping them in the face? That's, that's ridiculous. That's the opposite of what you do to someone you love, right? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that, obviously. But that, that's, one, that's one thing I'd love to hear you respond to. And the second one is like, hey, this is really playing with fire. Expe and this maybe brings trauma in, especially, you know, if someone's uh, disempowered, has trauma background. I've definitely had lovers that I, I had a felt sense that they were recreating something unhealthy and that recreating it wouldn't heal. 
and I've had other lovers who, who already had a sense of they were recreating something to heal and other lovers that I thought, wow, this is totally extreme and is no way related to your trauma and fucking let's go for it. Let's have a good time, you know, whatever. But, and that was as a sort of embodied trauma sensitive kind of person, I kind of had a bit of a sense of it, but without that knowledge, I can imagine people just um, riding rough shot over that, you know? For um, sure. Yeah. So first, first one, how would you respond to people saying like, Hey, this isn't healthy. This is a sickness. Hmm. Yeah. To that person, I would say, yeah, I love that. Oh, oh. That's what I do to them. <laughs> yeah. I hand them over my knee and spank them. <laughs> yes. That. And, um, I would, I would, I would, I would go as far as to say like, what feels unhealthy for me is having, um, the compulsive narrative of like heteronormative, missionary sex where we don't talk about what's going to happen that feels fucking scary to me because there is so much there is so much potential for misuse of power within that when people come together to have any kind of like sexual sensual exploration that involves vulnerable parts of their bodies explored by someone that they don't know so well it's like i feel like that that has there's equal space for corruption also uh, uh-huh. and if if that person if that person in that union wants to have their face slapped because they know they have the agency and have had the lived embodied experience of that creates orgasmicness in their body then it's then it's almost corruptive to to condescend that person and say like that's unhealthy it's like no it's unhealthy for you to not be interested in somebody else's pleasure <laughs> right all right, and our basic sex positive position is anything between consenting adults is healthy, right? Like that's none of your mm-hmm. business. It's none mm-hmm. of your fucking business if you know Mark likes to do it while I don't know wearing a chicken hat or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you'd be telling people to have sex with the lights on next, Melissa, with this kind of radical liberal <laughs> Berlin <laughs> philosophy you're throwing out there. You know, fucking hell. Okay, and then what about the second position that it could be playing with fire? Right. Yeah. I love that because I wanted to add on that to that same person. I would add the extra layer of, I, I want to say fuck yes to people knowing what it is that they want and that, you know, everything is, is positive within consent. And there is the extra layer of, and are you aware of why you want it? Like be, if I was having a conversation, not healthy, right? I've definitely right. had the experience of someone being really clear what they want and me still feeling in my bones just somatically uncomfortable because it felt profoundly unhealthy. Right. That it, yeah. And it's like, perhaps you were noticing that it didn't feel in its full integrity and that person didn't really understand or that person perhaps wasn't really like really sure about why it is that they wanted it or where it, where it is that that, that getting slapped in the face might get them. It's like they hadn't, Maybe they went in their integrity about Wait, that. Is there a line for you if someone said, hey, I want to do a Nazi commandant fantasy <laughs> and I'm Jewish? Or if someone said, I've actually had that request. If, if, <laughs> if someone said, um, uh, you know, like, is there a line for you? Not in terms of like physical harm, but in terms of like, how do you know something is unhealthy? Like, would you like, can mm. you pretend to be a member of my family? Can you recreate a scene where I was... Uh, abused you know is there a line for you there where you just go I mean I have I definitely have a comfort line where I go you know what just psychologically I don't want to go there like do you have a a line there or is that just individually a thing or is there a way of defining healthiness here yeah for sure I can answer on two accounts I can answer from my own personal view my own personal boundary i have my own personal boundaries too as as a dominant no like i'm also entitled to my own boundaries so i have my own personal boundaries around um around certain narratives like certain role plays um but that that's not necessarily negating whether it's healthy or not my overall kind of bird's eye view of whether something is healthy is based on um for me the main thing is actually the the physical sensational part of it are we mm-hmm. hunt, are we are we perpetuating stories of numbness in your body by hunting mm-hmm. for intensity mm-hmm. that's my own personal boundary as a practitioner i i don't want to i don't want to perpetuate numbness i want to bring in more sensitivity what I'm interested in is bringing in sensitivity and getting people into a relaxed parasympathetic state where they maybe get to understand more about their trauma than they understood mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. by having an experience, an experience of helplessness. You know, it's like, so let's say someone had a traumatic experience of helplessness. Well, I'm not going to not give them an experience of helplessness because they have that trauma in their body. What I'm going to do is create a container where they get the power of choice. I can see that they're able to say stop 
having mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. worked with them a little bit and tested them beforehand. I would never go into a full scene. Calibration. It's calibration yeah. principle, right? Like there's things I would yeah, do totally. lover on time 10 that I wouldn't do the first time I meet them. Right? right. For my own well-being, for legal protections, I would say as well. You know, like in terms of like, there's definitely be things where I went, if the police came in now, this would look bad. Um, <laughs> If the police came in now, we'd invite them in. No, but there's definitely been times when I've gone, okay, for me to have trust, I need to really get that there's trust there, that this person's well, that they're they're not going to make shit up, they're not going to talk about me, you know, in public space, you know, like there's different there's different kind of levels of trust there, and as you say, that works on both sides, and choice as ever is the key thing. You started off earlier talking about intensity. Maybe let's come back to that because I I think it's a way into the trauma conversation that Mm -hmm. you talked about the extreme sports of BDSM, right? And it Mm. it does have a way of getting more extreme in people. You know, it starts off with a light spank on the button. You know, before you know it, you're gagged and bound and you're being hit with sticks or something, you know? And it's, 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 it, it does. Why do people love the intensity so much? Is it just that they want to feel alive? Is it that they're covering up some sort of emotional pain? You know, I know from my experiences, when I was depressed, for example, I, when I was a teenager, I went for experience of cutting myself. And it was, it was tremendously relieving because I would feel the physical pain and not the emotional pain. It's an externalizing, mm. you know? And that wasn't necessarily the healthiest way to deal with it, but maybe it's all I had at you know, 14 years old. That's all I had, you know? Mm-hmm. And I go, is there a, a covering up of pain? Is, and there's an addictive quality of like, if nothing else, these, the endorphins and the adrenaline is a drug, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, for sure. I don't know about you, but it's not the same. You know, a little slap on the bum's not going to do much for me these days. Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm. there's a degree of habituating to this to some degree, right? So it's, it's like, yeah, talk to that. Talk to that. I want to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, it's like I'm even noticing the like the subtle, intricate. Well, it's not so subtle. It's kind of obvious, kind of power dynamic between us two too in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> which, which which is always the opposite of what it looks like, listeners. That's what I understand about power dynamics. Where it looks like the dom, not the dom. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I love, I love that question. Um, and when I answer that question, honestly, I run the risk of alienating myself from, from like different groups because okay. being on this podcast, I guess, I guess I have the potential to alienate myself because I'm talking about something that a lot of embodiment people might be, might feel, um, like judgmental about and how I wish to respond to this question is that this is the reason why, um, I find it difficult to I find it difficult to find my place in many um, kink positive communities fully because there is inherent there is in a there is an inherent kind of almost like a hunt for disembodiment within okay. some places. break from the interview to tell you about our shop and a deal we've got on there and also about some events that are coming up so if you go to embodied facilitator slash shop and use the code use the code podcast podcast 50 podcast 50 podcast 50 is the code you can get 50 percent off 50 percent off anything in the shop and what have we got on there how to design training trauma for facilitators breath work leadership resilience uh, life purpose there's a bunch of books there's a bunch of equal Courses, mostly for facilitators, trainers, coaches, yogis, different ebooks. But that code will give you 50% out of anything at all there in the shop. So that could save you, let's see, up to £100, which is about $120. So well worth having that code. Go to embodiedfacilitator.com slash shop. Also on that website, you will see embodiedfacilitator.com slash events dash calendar. Just look under events under the main title. You'll see all the stuff we've got coming up for events we regularly have free online events if you're interested in embodiment we have them on coaching life purpose marketing or trauma all sorts of things so have a look at the events page you can see the different one day events we've got coming up related to the conference and all kinds of other stuff okay so all of that is on embodiedfacilitator.com and remember that code there that code is podcast 50 if you want 50 percent off anything there you go a good deal back to the interview the spacing out sometimes these subspaces you say is people being completely dissociated as far as i can tell for others right. it's very different input. yeah it's totally 
Yeah, exactly. And for me, for me, I wouldn't, for me, when I'm doing a session with somebody, I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that person is not going into subspace, which is why it's what not... that is. Sorry, I used the term without explaining it for, for, our, oh, yeah. for our sweet, sweet vanilla listeners. Do you want to, do you want to put that one out there? Yeah. And it's good for everybody to know. Um, the subspace is this, I would say it's the hormonal cocktail that you get into when you're being dominated, where you drop into the parasympathetic nervous system and then past that layer, you kind of bliss out and you're not really there anymore and you disassociate. It's a disassociative state. It's so, um, would, would you say it was a freeze response? Like if I've got Stephen Porges' uh, trauma chart here of different nice. levels of activation. Nice. I mean, is it is it actually a type of um, hypo freeze response? It, or, you know, in terms of the sort of spacing out, the, the, the body, go, you know, if we read this, body goes flaccid, hypoventilation, mm-hmm. slow, low blood pressure. I mean, this is pretty yeah. simple. Like, is that just a trauma response or is it a sort of consciously enacted version of that? I don't want to just totally pathologize everyone that's into that. No, I'm, yeah, this is why it's super delicate territory because there are ways of getting into a, a bliss state. It's like my body worker teacher calls it the bliss body when it's the space in between pain and pleasure um, where you're able to feel more, you're able to get more sensitive. So I believe that there are, I believe that there are embodied ways of getting into like a bliss state. Mm-hmm. However, if you're not used to, to being in a relaxed parasympathetic nervous system state, which I just want to go ahead and generalize and say that like for a lot of people who are, who are into BDSM, there is a hunt for the vivid because there is a, there is a desire to feel. Right. And right. usually the desire to feel comes from a space of like not being able to sit with doing nothing, with feeling nothing, because to get to the side of feeling and sensitivity, we need to have a, a period of, 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 st- of like settling, of like letting the dust settle of our experiences so that we can then go to sensitivity. Does that make sense? I guess yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I spent like years this. doing snowboarding, martial arts and hard drugs. So for me, it was, you know, constantly looking for more and more stimulation. And I remember going, you know, I remember snowboarding after we snowboarded for a while, I was really hurtling down. I think it was a black slope, so a very steep slope and just feeling like this is no longer doing it for me. Maybe mm. I should close my eyes. You know, mm. like maybe I should take the, the level up a little bit by doing something stupid. And, um, and that's when I went, oh, that's how it works. There's a hedonic treadmill at work where more and more stimulus is needed to feel, just to feel, feel anything. And then, of mm. course, there's the numbness on the rest of life, you know? I've had mm. this post-war zones as well where I've got home and it was just like the mufflers were on everything. It's like hearing mm. everything through headphones, but not just for hearing, for all of your sensations, because it was like I just used to so much more extremity. And then mm. part of my own sobriety is coming back to the joy of the subtler things. I wonder if there's a similar journey with King that it's like, okay, I can, you can enjoy just, you know, a bit of moderate choking or something quite gentle. It's uh, there's a, so going from the extreme back down to like the appreciation of the more subtle. Yeah, totally. I feel like something that, well, so I'm a sadist, which means that I like to be mean in a, mm. in a conscious ethical way. And the way, that I, the way that I do that now as a facilitator is that um, I do kind of like tantric bondage retreats where, you know, I always, there's always this like this one couple who are like yeah. so experienced in BDSM. We're like yeah. super kinky yeah. and they're like doing all of the things with each other. They have all the tools yeah. and, and like for them, it's a mind fuck to do nothing. Nothing. It's a mind fuck. Right, right, right. I'm, te- I'm teaching people to do less. Right, to missionary position and a bit of hugging for you two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm not, not, I'm not here. I'm like, you need to, you two need to not touch each other, like for a <laughs> while, right? And then you can put rope on each other. But the, even then, like, the minute you notice yourself getting into your endorphin state of like wanting more, that's mm. when you do less. You step back when you when you're like taking that sip of like endorphin cocktail. You take a step back and you sip do less. the endorphin cocktail. Um, you know what I mean? I do. My mom went somewhere else. So <laughs> I like you. Uh, <laughs> it seems like this. <laughs> This is audio, not actually the YouTube people can see all of this. For everyone on uh, just listening to the podcast, you have no idea what's happening. Here. Make sure you go <laughs> to the YouTube channel to see this, the full, the full, I'm trying to get people to go to the YouTube channel as well as the podcast. So I'm all stripped there. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like you have some sort of um, reservations a little bit about where this is going. Now, on the one hand, 
conscious sex consent culture we're big fans right like tell me mm. if i'm speaking for you out of place we love that and the fact that kink is becoming more normal is great it's becoming more mainstream you know to me that could take some of the fun but it's also like okay it's good that people are more open-minded about sex potentially a sign of the fall of civilization by the way but that's a, that's a side issue <laughs> uh throughout history this has happened if you can actually study history you'll see this kink, kinkiness comes up at the end of a civilization um but this sounds like there's some sort of problems or things that are now sort of second order problems happening so do you just want to have a rant about that melissa like like like, what's fucking pissing you off right now in this space? Ah! 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 Go for it. Just go for it. Go for it. We can always edit it out if you go too far. Uh, so the thing that I noticed myself getting angry about isn't necessarily related to kink, although I guess it, it can be, is that there are so many people that want to, that, yeah, that want to join the, the sex positive train in a way because they see all these educators that are people that have like a huge collection of dildos and they're like looking really shiny in their lingerie on instagram lots of people on instagram right and they have like a bearded boyfriend that they have loads of photos with like it's like this is like the like the tantra like sex educator cliche and it's like it's like creating this whole new wave of like teaching people that they need to put more on top of who they are in order to like it's like it's just like identity whole, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's totally. the second matrix, right? It's like okay, yeah. it, and what are we? Saying? <laughs> Thank you for letting me rant about that. It's no, like, go oh. for it. You can go more. <laughs> this isn't like a scene. We can just take bits out. Imagine a kink scene where if you did something wrong, you just go, "We'll just delete that," and no one will ever know about it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, this is way more safe than real life. We can just take shit out. It's fine. It's fine. So, um, blah, 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 blah. oh, I'm glad we took that last part out. Um, all right, so. <laughs> I'm gone now, I'm completely gone. You've put me in uh, some other kind of space. So uh, imagine I just answer, ask a serious question and then answer it. Um, so yeah, that really touched me what you just asked me. <laughs> I'm really glad because I thought about that a lot. Okay, trauma. Yes, we're talking about trauma. That's what people are interested in. Everyone fucking loves trauma on this podcast. Oh my God, trauma is so popular. Eight out of ten of the top episodes of trauma. It's right. trending. Trauma's trending. This is this has got to be something to do with sex and trauma. By the way, listeners, if you're interested in sex and trauma, uh, we did do one other episode on that. One other episode on that. Um, so we'll, we'll post that as well in in the link. So trauma, kink. How do they fit together? Whew! I would say that um, one of the one of the most beautiful things about kink is that it can be a way of reclaiming your trauma. Um, okay. Navig it can be a way of like noticing it almost it's almost like a way of saying thank you to your trauma in a way you get to reclaim it and reown it and turn it into something and you get to transform it and that's not even that's not even if you're having a conscious relationship with that's not even if you're into embodiment or if you're into like traumatology or if you're looking at kink from like an embodiment perspective i just mean kink in a way i feel like if I was going to say what kink means in translation, it's uh -huh. taking something, something that traumatized you or something that, something that fractured the fabric of your sexual lineage, of your sexual history, and created a kind of quirky, quirky edge or like a quirky, a quirk, a quirk in your it's sexual nice, vocabulary. Like For listeners. Yeah, it's like a kink in the wheel or something, isn't it? maybe some of the foreign language listeners don't know what the word means in English, right? Like a kink is mm. like a little, well, how would you call, what would you say? How would you say, what's a synonym for that? Like a quirk you said, or it's like something that's not right, but it's sort of sweetly not right. Yeah. It's like something that's damaged, but it still works. Yeah. yeah. yeah I would a kink in that, but it doesn't mean it's a problem. It's just, right. it's, it's almost endearing, isn't it? That it's, it's like, a super endearing term. Like, Oh, that's just my kink. You know, it's like my friend, my friend, Dan, um, is he's a clown in one of his stand-up acts. He talks about like he had a really um, he had a really physically abusive younger sister, and is like kind of a is of it's a sad story. And however, he's just like, oh well, I got a kink out of it now. I just like to be beaten up by strong women from time to time. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like such a there's something yeah. profoundly empowering about that, right? This word empowerment's used far too often. I never know what the fuck it means, but right in terms of like, okay, something that was a bad thing in my life that now I have taken control over, I've got consent around, you know, even if it's say being tied up in here, it's like, okay, but you're still in charge. You still get to say no or yes to that, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's this consent there. And taking that part of yourself back as something even to the point where it becomes part of one of the most fun things in your life. 
And I think, you know, I, I have this felt sense that's quite delicate ground we're treading on. People might say, oh, you're not taking my trauma seriously. Or are you saying that, mm. you know, actually trauma's a gift? Or, and it's like, nah, I've got to be very careful by saying anyone's trauma's a gift because they you know, might have been through hell. So it's, mm. it's, it's, it's delicate ground, isn't it? It is. And I want to honor that. Like, yeah, I, I want to honor that. And it's a super... And this is why with, although I'm having this, we're having this chat about BDSM and it's super flirty and silly and it's, yeah, it's like the most ridiculous chat I've had about BDSM in a long time. <laughs> it's also, a, it's also medicine for me because I am always thinking about BDSM from a healing shamanic perspective because I am a traumatized person and I have needed to, mm. or I have needed to find I have needed to find healing in it because I needed it to save me and I've recognized how it can save others. Um, yeah. Of the kink scene, would you say most people are fun orientated or most people are healing orientated or some cocktail of the two? Or, cause for example, like, I mean, I've had sort of, well, you might say kink experiences without them being sexual as well. Like, for example, I was getting massaged once by this big Russian guy and he didn't really speak. You're going to love this story. Okay. But it's just fucking smiling now. <laughs> And he's a huge, big Russian man. We're in the bathhouse. We're naked. And he's... Ma- yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a nice story. Can just continue to enjoy it. And he's massaging me. And he's massaging me more hard than I can handle. And he doesn't speak English. And at the time, I didn't speak Russian. And I'm like, stop, stop. And he just laughs, right? He's like, ho, ho, ho. This, this isn't consent culture, okay? And at a certain point, I just have to surrender to it. And I'm not really a submissive kind of guy, but I was like, okay, this is really all I have left to do because I was in such pain. And I surrendered into it. And then I was like, I was blissed out for two days. Mm. Now, at no point did I want to fuck the guy or did I get a hard on or, you know, but it Mm. was a profoundly interesting psychological experience. Mm -hmm. I think on some level may have been healing for me for someone who's a bit of a control freak to kind of let go and you let go, let go and surrender. And I do, Mm -hmm. I do this to a lesser degree every time I have a massage now, like I ask for it at some point to be hard so I can practice surrendering as as an embodiment practice. But Mm -hmm. that's my orientation is very much looking at things psychologically and emotionally in terms of trauma. Mm -hmm. Would you say most of the scene does that or is it more just like, well, let's have fun, which is fine as well, right? Thank you for using that example. I feel like it helps me to, it helps me to answer you in the way that I get to say the word healing I also feel gets misused overused in different contexts as well because what's healing for one person might be just fun for another what's you know you know what I mean it's like um for on my I've also recognized that the layers of healing are varied I've seen people in my workshop spaces have a super healing experience over the fact that it's also it doesn't need it's not compulsively sexual cake And that in itself can be healing for someone that's like, for someone that's been sexually abused, for somebody that's been consumed, maybe for someone that's been a sex worker as well. The idea of having an intimate encounter that has nothing to do with transaction or sexuality is healing for right, someone, right. for someone yeah. that has body dysmorphia, having a sexual experience or an intimate experience that doesn't have anything to do with their genitals is healing. You know, you don't necessarily need to be like beating a drum and, you know, burning sage in the room or like, you know, you Using intention for it to be healing healing is individual also which yeah. i feel like bdsm offers that empowering lens that healing is individual within within if the you BDSM. ever burn sage in my house melissa do i have permission to punch you out just just, just to <laughs> well then it will out. be a healing yeah. encounter because we've got the sage <laughs> we've got punching <laughs> it'll be definitely be a healing encounter <laughs> Okay, shit. Where are you now, by the way? Did you get back to Germany? You're in Berlin? Yeah, you, I'm in Berlin. You're in Bali, right? And now you're, gonna... you're in, in the yeah. Berlin. We have a lot of listeners from the Berlin here. Um, okay, okay. So you're part of that scene. Mm. Hmm. How, I mean, is embodiment influencing the kink world? I mean, the two seem to be merging and mingling. Trauma-informed, embodiment, you know, mindfulness. I mean, you know, that wasn't in the 70s you know that mindfulness wasn't around in the western world in a big way so i mean how are these mingling that's what i'm curious about yeah it's a good question i feel like it's beginning to mingle more and more and more um one yeah and i feel like i find it difficult to talk about i feel like i'm really in like i often say i'm I'm in like the armpit of like the the embodiment and bdsm culture because i feel like berlin as you know is that intersection of all of these different 
things. It's like all of these different people come together in this boiling pot of culture in Berlin. And so like I started off my, I started off my BDSM journey or rather I even started off my BDSM and my embodiment journey um, at Schwelle Sieben, this beautiful space in Berlin that, um, that Felix Rucker started. And Felix Rucker is a choreographer. Okay. And so on a, you know, it's like on a Tuesday it would be contact improv. It, that turns into a play party. And then it would be, you know, and then there'd be somebody getting tied in one end of the oh, room. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. You know, somebody getting Tesco in the other side of the room. It's like, that's it's great. It's like, I don't know why I'm Dutch now, but it's like, there's the dolphins and the contact improv, and then we blow off the unicorns. And it's, you know, I'm a Dutch vision at Tish's party. It's amazing. I mean, is it too much sometimes living in Berlin? Do you not sometimes yeah. go, you know what, oh, I just want... I just want a quick doggy style fuck. Like, that's all I want. I don't want any of this. It's all over. It's just over the top. Like, does it ever get to that point? For me? It's easy to try and get soon. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> all, I'm saying. all I'm saying is lockdown's ending soon. <laughs> yeah. And if it leaves us in, fuck it. Um, I'm super old school. I'm romantic as hell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> moods, different moods. What do you think the wider embodiment world can learn from the kink scene then? What, what do you, what, I mean, consent is the obvious one, right? But is, is, there, is there anything you think we can really learn us, us more vanilla embodiment people? For sure. I feel like communication is the, is the piece. Communication. Communication is the piece. However, I feel like the, um, the kink scene can also learn and are learning from the embodiment world about how to notice the sensations in their body and understand how the things they're doing with their body can influence their mind, like getting in touch with their body mind. So I feel like uh, I want to say what the embodiment world could learn from the kink world. And I also want to like, I want them to be, I want, I want them to be speaking to each other more. Great. And I think that is happening now because the kink word's not so hidden. I mean, when I first tried to get kink people on the podcast, it was difficult because I, I kind of bumped into it through you. And then I'd gone, okay, that's really interesting. As an embodiment researcher, I was like, okay, there's something here. I could see there was a body of knowledge, you know, very literally. And certainly the consent stuff impressed me a lot as someone that was bringing that into their yoga and things. But then I, I actually struggled to get people on the podcast. But just recently, I put a shout out again. I got like 10, 20 recommendations for people, you know, some from you, but it's also from all sorts of other people. So I'm, I'm hoping this communication does go both ways. I think it could be, um, yeah, a very constructive thing. It's happening. I mean, the thing that I want to speak to is that in the kink world, there there have, I feel like we're also coming out the same way that everybody is coming out of their dogmatic structures. I feel like also the kink world is coming out of their dogmatic structure. Okay. Their, their dog, I feel like the dogmatic, the, the dogmatic structure that the kink world lives in is that it's very kind of like, it's quite, it's, it's quite anti hippie. It's very like, okay. ah, like ah, anything that's like hippie is like bad or anything that, that, that looks like that kind kind of archetypal um, energy of like hippiness or, or like softness or um, really nice yeah, like femininity. Really can I well. say how you look a little bit different than last time I saw you? Yes. Um, is that a real yes or is that a maybe? It's a yes. <laughs> you, look a bit, you look a bit softer. You look mm. a bit softer. Have you like reintegrated some of your hippiness in hanging out in Bali or like what, what's happened there? I'm curious. Hmm. Yeah, there's been a softening. Yeah, like I said, since we had this, since we last chatted, um, I had my had my beautiful tumbling into my own sensitivity. Um, and what I realized was that my identity politics and my own dogmatic structures around my own being, around being seen as a very like scary, intimidating, masculine, like I want to use the word masculine for how I felt like I wanted to feel back then. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I realize, like, I've realized recently that those words, masculine and feminine, are words that I've liberated out of their gendered constructs. So now I'm like, I can look as feminine as I like, and it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm X, Y, Z, you know? It just, uh-huh. Uh-huh. It just yeah. 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 Well, there's, there's a journey, isn't there, from blind acceptance to blind rejection to choosing when, where, and how to accept or not. And that, that's with any, any mainstream societal concept, you know, nationalism, gender, whatever. So mm. there, is, there is definitely a journey there. And often mm. Berlin is often in the uh, blind rejection category. If, if you sure. But it's still and, a progress, you know, from just completely unconsciousness. Uh, yeah. And then an extra piece on top of that is that mm. I am 
um, a social scientist, I feel like what I'm most interested in is ri- is like seeing how people respond to things that challenge their their mind. Like to yeah, I'm just really interested in seeing people try things and like do things they didn't know. And I feel like I've noticed that when my appearance is softer or when my appearance is more accessible to people, it's like when I look less scary, people are able to, I feel like people listen to me more when I'm talking about scary topics. Okay. Okay. So it helps, it helps as an in for people. Like if I wear a suit when I'm in business, for example, it just helps the message, the message which might be a bit scary and freaky to people. Yeah. yeah totally yeah yeah okay, where do we find you on the internet melissa what where do people um, yeah so you can find me under all of my work is under elemental eros so elemental it's eros. elemental eros.com so it's elemental dash eros.com you can find me on facebook under Instagram. elemental eros. oh my god we're not friends on the gram i'm gonna have to add you up there you don't work oh for oh, it. oh I yeah think i unfollowed you because it was too distracting um, I think I <laughs> then, deliberately unfollowed you because it was wrecking my work days. <laughs> but, and uh, then, um, and then some the a lot of the workshop spaces that I do are in a collective called Tender and Feral, which is bringing soft, squishy alternatives to the kink world here in Berlin. So my right. work for that is under Tender and Feral. So, tender and Feral. Maybe I should call this one Tender, tender and Feral would be a pretty good name for this one. It does sound like we're the tag team here. I'm not sure who's who, though. Tender and Feral. <laughs> I can guess. <laughs> It's always the one you don't expect, though. It's always the one you don't expect. Okay, we have come to a climax. We have come to near the end. Oh, yeah? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> you're, like, yeah. you're like, no, I haven't. I'm not done yet. I've heard this story before. Yeah, I'm not story. satisfied. There's so much pain, <laughs> so much trauma. Listen, <laughs> she's not done and I have to go. Um, okay, I do need to go shortly. So do you have like a closing message? About, I'm just going to keep going for it, Melissa. And keep penetrating. Do you have a clear <laughs> message about the body for our listeners? Mm, yeah, I like the idea of us being in service to being obedient to our true nature. Be, mm. be the sub of your true nature. I'm yes, totally, I'm totally the bitch of my life purpose. That is totally how I am. Okay. Melissa, this has been gorgeous. I'm borderline too gorgeous to publish, but fuck it. So um, thank you so much for your time. Mm, Thank you. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, Yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, this comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy, and of course, there's our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up, and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes. Uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there, bit long Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you Mm